This week on Barbell Shrug, we interview Jim Keen, President and COO of the NPFL. Ain't that right, Jim? That's right. I'm happy to be on. <laughs> Boom. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with uh, Doug Larson and CTP. We have traveled to Atlanta for the NPFL Combine. If you don't know what that is, go to NPFL.com. Check it out. We are standing here with Jim King. He's the COO and president of the NPFL. Howdy, y'all. And uh, he's come on to explain to us exactly how this NPFL thing is going to work. I know there's a lot of questions out there. This this has moved really fast. We podcasted about this uh, a little while ago, uh, quite a few episodes ago, and we did our best job from looking at the website. I got to talk to Tony a little bit. Might not kind of, have had all our facts correct. Yeah, you know, yeah, we most definitely probably didn't have all of our facts right on, but uh, we've got Jim here to clear all that up. Uh, and you were brought on to the NPFL. Uh, I guess you were you were approached by Tony to kind of change. Yeah, make yeah. It, make it change the game a bit. Well, he didn't know uh, that he wanted to change the game, but uh, you know, I had the whole Silicon Valley thing going on, and, uh-huh. and it was kind of an interesting story. December third of last year, I sold Wellness FX, and literally that day, I was running around trying to find a bank account to deposit um, some escrow money to drive some weird LLC thing to support the transaction. I hate it when I can't find bank accounts yeah. to put large sums of money in. <laughs> so he uh, happens he, all the time. I, I was supposed to go meet him, and uh, I apologize because uh, Wells Fargo couldn't get his great but yeah. finally got down there and we we're talking about uh the league and whatnot and and uh, i started saying well you know it's not a website actually this is an unparalleled opportunity to design a sport from the ground up because if you think about football that was a hundred years of, of making and only in the last 30 years have you grafted this digital interface you know right. uh, on top of it and all these other tools so you kind of had to adapt to the sport versus build the sport from the ground up with game mechanics, fan engagement, all these different things that the last 10 years, uh, the internet and Silicon Valley has really popularized. It's kind of like well, with the NBA, they changed the sport. They, I know that they like, even changed some rules to make it more spectator friendly, uh, to, to make it easier for people to watch on TV, all that kind of stuff. But this is a sport that's being started with the technology already in place, so nothing has to change. You can build the sport around the technology and the fan base. Pretty much. I mean, the the kind of golden frontier for this sport is to make it more approachable. Like, if you see somebody and they're supposed to do 100 pull-ups and you can't quite decide how many he's on or this and that, or let's say you have the – you grab, you talk to your buddy for a second about his girlfriend or grab a chip, you look back and go, damn, who's in the league? Yeah. Or it has to pass the beer test. Can you mm-hmm. walk away and come back and see who's in the league? Uh, can you – and a lot of this stuff – the sport's not that unapproachable if you think about it. You have to do some infographics. Uh, you have to do things that allow somebody to instantly look at it. And we're really trying to make this more mass appeal versus just for the hardcore fan. Mm-hmm. Hardcore fan's going to find a ton of stuff they love because it's going to be statistical. And, you know, CrossFitters like to count everything, right? Yeah. But, so what kind of innovation have you guys done where you can tell who's winning no matter, like, if you show up halfway through through an event or through a well, – uh, should we should we go rewind a little bit and maybe explain exactly how the whole event works? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. maybe maybe from from an overview what what the spectator or an athlete could expect from the NPFL, how this sport might be different than anything people have seen before, and then maybe get into that. Yeah, yeah, people sure. Probably so, are like these guys just jump right into the weeds. So we we patented something uh, called the start line and the finish line. No, wait, that's already <laughs> been done, right? So, but anyway, uh, you, you do take a couple things that. People have to have anchors that they can uh, walk in and say, hey, I kind of recognize this as a sport. So in a race, there's always a start line and a finish line. So if you look at our grid, there's a start line and there's a finish line. So it passes the beer test, right? You walk away to get a beer, you come back, you go, who's winning? Mm -hmm. 
the guy who's closest to the finish line. Right. Mm-hmm. So and this is a team sport. Yep. Two lanes. Uh huh. Rigs between. Uh, the new rig that's coming up is going to have more angles from both sides of the audience. So everything we're doing is designed to provide a spectator fantastic angles into looking at the sport. All that's going to be supported with infographics. So we have a couple screens for our users that uh, every combine now we've run tests. Mm-hmm. Just started out really Rube Goldberg or kind of MacGyver type of, uh, um, you know, paper tests as well as PowerPoint and all that. But then we take those, we go back, iterate, write code against it, and come back. And this week we're going to deploy on a couple races some infographics. So we have one that has just an ungodly amount of reps. And the athletes, three of them, are really close together. So it's one of those typical kind of workout races where you're going, who the hell is in front? All right. Yeah. So what we're doing is kind of a gas tank principle where you start with a full tank and as the reps get done and the scorekeeper on the side mm-hmm. inputs it into our system, you'll see this tank depleting and you'll see who's in, in front and who's behind. So just so, be able to look at the screen and it'll be obvious. Absolutely. You'll say, oh, wow, Team A's in front. Look at their tanks less. So uh, people essentially consume information the most efficiency uh, efficiently with pictures. Yeah, you know, I so I know I do. Yeah, so yeah. if you have a, a picture that graphically represents a number, boom, you just go that. I, I totally understand who's in front, what's going on, everything like that. Going forward, what's interesting is uh, we're going to experiment with things like uh, radio frequency devices called RFIDs. So you can have each athlete with an RFID, right? Like they do in triathlon races. So mm-hmm. when they substitute. You can see if they committed a foul by uh, going on before they should have, like before they're kind of like hockey. Yeah, exactly. So, you, so the Line coaches are going to have the freedom to be like, you know, uh, they can pull athletes at any time during the yeah. event. You can pull an athlete, throw another athlete in. Yeah, but they have specific rules how they tag in and out. Uh-huh. And uh, on a couple of the workouts, they have to stand in particular parts of the grid, which is the flooring that we talk about. Uh, and the grid basically is the same size as a basketball arena, so it's 50 by 94. Mm-hmm. So one, one thing, uh, you guys actually did a fantastic job with almost zero information on your last podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was sitting there blown away. I mean, you had, uh, uh, like your comment about um, this could be in high schools. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting if it's standardized. Uh, one guy out of the Dallas Combine said, hit two of his athletes. Uh, he, they're advancing to Vegas, and... He's, he writes me, he says, I'm setting up my own grid and my own knockoff rig. Uh, I want your dimensions, this and that, because I'm going to start having pickup games uh, and I'm going to train my athletes on the grid. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So you can really see how once you standardize like that across a certain dimension, then it allows you to capitalize and piggyback on existing athletic facilities. Yeah, I, I think it's really great because uh, – People always want to mimic after, like, say, the CrossFit Games or something. And they think that it has to be a three-day event, and it has to have, yeah. like, it, it has to, you know, part of it has to be inside and outside and all this kind of stuff. And you guys kind of change the game, make it more accessible to the average person because it's only a two-hour event. I don't have to commit a whole weekend right. if I want to go watch it or if I want to, like, have a pickup game. Like, I could bring one gym versus another or something like that. It makes we it very just, hard to scale. And we could just use... The rules that are, you know, provided yeah. by you guys. You guys create the rules, and y- y'all are testing it, and we don't have to, you know, try to make them up as we go. Well, because it's standardized, too, uh, going forward, we can sell the rigs. And then increasingly over the next uh, three to five years as we go, we can embed electronics, for example, in the flooring. So you'll have LEDs. So I was uh, telling Mike, uh, you know, one thing that you can possibly do mm-hmm. is if you're tracking somebody with a GPS across the grid, yeah. this athlete... Uh, when they're doing double unders, right? Imagine you're standing there, double, 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 as goes 19, 20, 21. Right. Audience can see it, but yeah. so can the athlete. And maybe you color code it like it's red if you're behind. So okay. So there's all kinds of ways that you can kind of um, enhance the experience for the athlete and the fans, make it really approachable. Um, in, in a way, it's almost like a gigantic video game. Yeah, so when you were brought in, you saw this huge opportunity to, to kind of tweak things from like a, you have, that, you have that Silicon Valley background. It's like, oh, how can we use technology to to make this more fan friendly? You got, you were telling me earlier that you would, you're gonna do an experiment on Sunday, yeah. right? You're doing an experiment. Uh, Sunday is the day. So the, the ladies go on Friday here at the combine. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, they've got a one rep max on a lot of lifts. They've got to do uh, rep maxes on some uh, gymnastics movements, and there's just some a couple other things. You're gonna do a couple of us uh, individual wads. Uh, Metcons, and then the guys are on Sunday, and then on on 
or uh, Saturday, and then on Sunday they team up. So you're going to pair people up, and right. they're going to actually compete, and we're going to be able to see what it looks like, you know, what a NPFL competition might look like. But you guys are running an experiment, and you're you're trying to figure out during the combine how to get more fan engagement. Yeah, so I, I, I want to make it instantly approachable. So I, I imagine uh, when you're developing uh, computer applications and, and user-friendly games and whatnot, uh, what you do is create what you call personas. Like uh, my average fan is 36 year old woman well educated has two kids uh and would love to have a sport that catered to her um and maybe the way she brings in new fans is somebody goes wow i'd like to date her and then somebody goes wow she loves the mpfl and some guy goes what is the mpfl i don't know what it is but she likes it Uh, i'm getting into that i'm gonna go tell her i like it right so then he goes in and sits down he may not know anything about the sport so that's what we call, if you have this continuum of naive to really super nerdy uh, money ball fan, right? Yeah. So on this end of the spectrum, you want to bring that person in, have an easy on-ramp where they Im- immediately have some sort of uh, subconscious attachment and delight to the sport. Mm-hmm. And then what you want to do is then migrate them to a higher point as a higher level fan where they're mm-hmm. constantly consuming more statistics, they get involved in fantasy all the different things so but you usher them along uh, yeah. kind of a, basically an addictive path right yeah i mean yeah. i know uh, a lot of baseball football basketball fans i mean they know all the stats of all the athletes and that's yeah. something we don't do now we don't we don't know the stats of the athletes they can they can say oh i do this or i do that but people are going to show up here to the combine and they're going to they're going to their stats will probably start there right you guys are collecting their stats here yeah no we're we're going to be a completely stat driven engine um, but the other thing is is we see ourselves as essentially an open source company so we'll have these stats collected but then we're going to make them available to all of our legions of followers in really easily supported data structures so what that means is you can pull these numbers down and begin because a lot of the money ball stuff in baseball happens by a lot of rocket scientist guys who decided to devote their lives to wasting it on sports versus like you know things for humanity or whatever right but then they compete with each other to who has the most useful statistical analysis right and then teams go out and actually look for guys like that but you were describing to me something that happened i think it was in la uh, yeah that was the two guys started at different weights Oh, so so the barbell ladder was fascinating. So um, I ran that as an experiment on the last race, collected a ton of stats, and then I fed them back to the coaches afterwards. And so we were having a debate about who's more effective because they said, wow, this guy started higher on the barbell ladder. His total poundage was better. But Mm. then the coach says, yeah, but I allocated a minute to him. And athlete, male athlete three, uh, the one who had the third highest total of the, of the four athletes, uh, the male athletes, he actually only had 40 seconds, but he was so efficient and fast, even though he started at 135 into the 210, mm. uh, he actually did 25 pounds a second. And this other guy did 21. So he actually was a far more uh, useful athlete during this match. You're trying to see who can get to the highest total poundage in a certain specific time or who can get to the highest weight or yeah, I, so I missed the, what the event was. So event uh, race seven is always a, uh, some sort of ladder. In L.A. it was a snatch ladder. And this one was a power clean to a snatch clean or a, a squat clean, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And so uh, – But it's still a ladder. And so the way that one's scored is you get two points uh, in that race for uh, your total. But then uh, whoever has as the subtotal, the highest female total, gets another point. So you kind of got to use everybody on your team. Can you move the ladder as fast as you want? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like you can even run somebody through and tell them, look, you you suck at at barbell sports, so we're going to run you through. Um, And our other guy's going to get more time on there. And you have a seven-minute time cap to see who can get the most poundage. Gotcha. What are some other things you're going to do with the stats, like that you see maybe people using these stats for? Because, you know, people people create games and stuff out of these stats. Well, you know, I'm actually – so here's here's an idea. Memphis, Tennessee, you guys just got awarded the uh, team ownership group there. What kind of uh, skills do you put together to have a fast twitch workout team uh, that can go out and kick ass? Do you need like four or five Swiss Army Knife type athletes or pretty darn good at everything? Maybe a yeah. guy was 28th in the world in the open. 
or do you run over to Eastern Europe and, and grab some <laughs> sort of Kazakhstani who... Uh, Probably grab the Kazakhstani for you sure. <laughs> 63 kilogram woman who can clean and jerk 308 and you say good strength to weight ratio, I'll teach her how to do some of the other stuff to get by. I mean, how, yeah. how do you put all that together? So one of the big debates going on right now um, as far as between fans and coaching staffs is who's a more effective athlete Mm -hmm. and who's going to allow you to to run these races efficiently and quickly. So uh, there's a lot of factors. The other thing we're really starting to see is you can be a spectacular athlete, but if you're a knucklehead... um, You may not do well on the team. No, I mean, because you have to have this kind of certain amount of proprioception about your teammates. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there's one workout where it's three guys going at once or three girls, and you can tap out when you're on the field. Mm-hmm. So, let, like, the very last part of that workout is uh, deadlifts. So, this one event, this guy, these three guys run up, and this one guy, just huge, strong guy, crushes the deadlift, 15 reps like that. Yeah. The other two guys were maybe on their third or fourth rep when he was done. Hmm. And he was smart enough. He actually went over to the guy who, even though it looked like he was uh, ahead, he was the weaker deadlifter, and he was fading fast. So, he tapped him out, finished his reps, and then tapped out the other guy, got his last five. Damn. So <laughs> Gotta let the ego go there. If you're yeah. an ego driven athlete, totally. man, you you may not do well in that, that arena. And interestingly, the team they were competing against, um, they were ahead when they hit the deadlifts, but they lost on uh, athletic smartness because one of their guys tried to tap this guy out and he waved him off like, No, 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 I'm gonna crunch out all the reps and this and that right. and, and that was a totally wrong move. He had he didn't have uh, athletic pr- proprioception about what was going on around him. Yeah, how, how involved are the coaches going to be during the matches? And it sounds like you're going to be able to move people in and out. Are the coaches going to be, can they, like, not step onto the, the court? Or, you know, are they going to have to yell? Or can, so they, right have, now, can they have Right now we're letting, them, we're letting them sit in there. Uh-huh. But um, we're debating things like maybe they're, it's like basketball where they have to be on the sidelines. They can run up and down right. the sidelines. Uh-huh. Uh, but right now coaches are pretty involved. I mean, you, you'll hear him say, okay, uh, go to 12, go to 12. Like he'll be on rep eight. And so really good coaches are going to be really awesome at figuring out what the capabilities of all their, the pieces they have and be able to figure out who is got the most in the tank or who's particularly best for a particular situation. Yeah. And we actually, uh, being kind of fiendish game guys, uh, we <laughs> see coaches as being um, almost polarizing subjects full of debate. So I think we will have won yeah. if afterwards on talk radio somebody's going, that guy needs to be fired. He is the biggest fucking idiot in the world. Yeah, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he should have never subbed that guy off. He lost 10 seconds. They lost in the match because of that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lack of discipline about tag outs. It continually penalizes right. him. I mean, you can imagine the debates. Yeah. And then you can see the afterwards. Maybe the guy has the kind of stony face Bill Belichick. He says, so, Coach, why'd you do that? Well... I really know the physiologic capabilities of my athletes, and uh, I, in my best judgment, team that <laughs> we we needed to sub out athlete A for athlete B because uh, you know his skill set isn't beyond that. You know, yeah, thing like that. In a sport like this, I mean, and I mean, we'll we'll compare it to CrossFit quite a bit for I think maybe obvious reasons, but like you know, the coaches aren't involved in the sport while it's happening. You know, most coaches are looked at as like the strength and conditioning coach. You know, they're the program design. But now you've got coaches that, you know, they're actually coaching the sport itself, which is a little bit different. Yeah, completely. I mean, I, I think it takes them up to another level of how much they need to know about their athletes and uh, what they can do, when to sub them out, too. And if you think about it, it's, it's kind of – I mean, I'd love to get your guys' take on after a two-hour match with 11 races with breaks between. So you get to sub out, but you, there's only one speed, as Tony says, is full speed. And, yeah, and I've talked to a lot of the athletes afterwards. They're pretty good friends of mine. A lot mm-hmm. of games athletes. They said, "What was the difference for you in these races?" And they go, "You know what? It is a completely fast twitch sport, and maintaining kind of being warm. Um, oh yeah, and, and just going staying warm for two hours. Yeah, yeah. even though it keeps right. cycling and all that. Uh, you know, it, it's just completely different mentality. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of different things, and, and I think the coach is going to have to be really smart. I also think um, this year is kind of a everybody's pretty friendly. Uh, of course, we're all in this <laughs> together type thing. But next year you start getting uh, big TV contracts, sponsorships, things like that. Whenever you have money come in, 
think, you know, absolutely start getting blood in the water, right? Yeah, and I'm so, looking forward to it. I think it'll be fun to watch. No, it's going to be great. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny. In 2006, I was actually involved in the in MMA. Uh, I was filming a documentary, mm-hmm. so I got to know a lot of the fighters. And that was the year that Dana White got that first big TV contract, and it was transformative. I mean, the um, athletes all of a sudden weren't working three jobs to yeah. support training. If you even had one or two fights, you're getting fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and you can mm-hmm. support that. And then if you moved up even a little bit more, you got a bigger pay scale. And so what happened is actually all the old school uh, MMA guys got cycled out because you had this huge influx of like X D one players who just missed the NFL draft. Or, yeah, yeah. You know the the athletic potential went way up, and mm-hmm. I actually think. This is going to be kind of a vacuum that draws people in. You're going to attract athletes, which would yeah. normally not compete in the sport of fitness. Yeah, and it, it's a truly a worldwide sport too. Because mm. if you're going back to the to the Memphis team, you know, yeah. Memphis Grizzlies. Oh wait, no. uh, <laughs> you may be thinking, I, I need that Kazakhstani person who yeah. uh, is going to look at this as living large just for a three month season. But, yeah, uh, you know, you're gonna. It's not like you have to grow up playing American football to play the game here. Yeah. I mean, these are all basically transnational skills. Yeah, yeah. especially if you don't have to be well-rounded. That that expands the pool of athletes exponentially. Yeah, a lot of guys don't mm-hmm. get past regionals if they have even one hole in their game, but mm-hmm. might be just spectacular athletes. Yeah. So I'm interested to see how, and this is one of the things I want to talk to the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you already have like your ideas on it, but I want to talk to like all the coaches, managers, and owners and how they want to round out their teams. You know, Do they want all specialists do they want you know what's their ratio of specialists to generalists because it's probably going to benefit you to have you know the generalist you know a rich froning you know yeah so how do you how do you how do you rate a draft board so, so imagine we get through vegas right yeah you have about 200 athletes on there um and you so you have uh you know strength you have body weight a couple categories and let's say you design a because uh, Americans love zero to 100 scales. Um, use it for school and for wine and whatever. Right. Right. <laughs> so you start saying, all right, that athlete's a 90 because of this, this, and this. I mean, whoever comes up with that scoring mechanism, uh, those are all things that right now uh, mm. te- uh, NFL teams pay for as far as analysts who do that. Uh, uh, so there might be an opportunity for uh, jobs created as analysts. Like yeah, if you're, if you're a good statistician, Mel Kuyper's yeah. draft board, you could have the barbell shrugged, uh, you know, draft board, and you could put something up there and probably have ten thousand people calling in to, to uh, complain about how badly you organized it. If, right? if you're <laughs> if you're a superb statistician, just uh, shoot, hit me up on Twitter. We might have a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure out how to monetize that. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let's go ahead and take a break, and maybe we'll bring Tony on next. And uh, thanks for joining us, Jim. Oh, you bet. Always great to see you guys. Appreciate it. All right, welcome back to Technique Quad. Uh, This is video one of a five-part video series on the clean. We already did an overview video, and now this is the starting position video. Isn't this going to be video two? Video two out of six, or one out of five. (laughs) (laughs) He should have been recording his... Should have been recording the conversation he's had with himself. All right, I'm Doug Larson with the Barbell Shrug Podcast. This is Alex Macklin. People now know him as the guy with the sweet Batman ring. Uh, Today we're going over the starting position for the clean. So we're going to go over each position, or excuse me, we're going to go over um, each piece of the position, what to do, what not to do, and then show you again what to do. All right, the very first thing that we're going to look at is, is how Alex approaches the bar and how far away from his body he starts Um, with the bar. So if he comes close to the bar here, he's basically going to put the bar right over basically where his toes start. So maybe the end of his laces, you can see there's a little bit of space right here and the bar is right over right where his toes begin. Okay, so now when he gets into position his knees come forward, his shins are actually going to come forward towards the bar. There you go. So now that his shins are forward, he might be touching, maybe he'll have a little tiny bit of space, but for the most part, he'll be touching the bar, or at least very close. Uh, the other little thing is that he's hook gripping the bar. So I'll go and show hook grip the other way so they can see. So he's reaching around with his first two fingers and he's grabbing his thumb. That's important because as it rolls out of his hand, it's gonna roll into his thumb, and as it rolls out of his thumb, it's gonna roll into his hand. It's gonna make it where you can have a more relaxed grip and you're not gonna lose grip on the bar. If you don't hook grip the bar, since it's very 
very spinny, if you will, is going to roll right out of your hands. So you want to definitely hook grip so you can be nice and relaxed, but still have a good grip on the bar. All right, the other thing for um, the initial starting position is how wide to grab. You can see Alex has a straight arm, and basically his form is right outside of his knee, and he's grabbing as close as he can where he's not having to make his knees dive in to make room for his forearm. Okay? So his knees are out, and then his arm is nice and straight, and he's grabbing the bar uh, basically as, as close together as he can where he's not screwing up his knee position. Okay? If you have longer arms like, like someone like I do, uh, I tend to grab a little bit wider. By, by grabbing wider, my hands go higher. So I grab a little bit wider just because it makes the bar hit a little higher on my thighs. That's personal preference. You can play with it. Uh, but for the most part, you're just going to grab right outside of wherever your knee position is where you can have a good grip on the bar with a straight elbow. So if Alex gets in a good starting position, we're going to start top down looking at his shoulders. All right, so you can see Alex's shoulders are in front of the bar. He doesn't want to be, have his shoulders behind the bar. So he's sitting back too much right there. So again, shoulders are in front covering the bar. Okay? Also, his shoulders are slightly together. They're not loose and sloppy forward like that. He hasn't lost stability. He wants his shoulders back like that. Okay? Also, his back is nice and tight, nice and flat. He doesn't want to be excessively round. There you go, round even more. It's about all the more Alex can round. So pull back tight again. There you go, so nice and tight. We need to, we need to get you, you get, like, like more low back mobility so you can round and make it look terrible. All right, so here Alex is again in a good position. You can see his shoulders are here, hips are lower, knees are slightly below his shoulders, but his, his hips are down quite a bit. That way he's a nice steep back angle. His hips aren't really high. Gonna pick your hips up even further if you can. Some people start with their back almost flat to the ground. He wants to have his hips down nice and low like that on his first pull. All right, now that we've looked at Alex's back, it's nice and straight, hips are down. We're gonna look at his knees. His knees are out towards the outside of his foot. His knees are never going to dive in. Okay? His knees are never going to dive in. They're always going to be pushed out towards his forearm. Okay? Along with that, you never want knees diving in while being excessively towed out, way out like that. Usually when people's knees dive in, they tow out a lot at the same time, and that's how you twist your knee and hurt your knee. Okay? So you don't want to do that. You want your toes to be somewhat straight ahead. You don't need to be perfectly straight ahead, that's, that's not necessarily important, but you want uh, to have your knee, no matter where your toes are pointing, slightly to the outside of your toes. All right, the last thing for uh, your foot position is how you're going to distribute your weight on your feet. So for the most part, with the starting position, you want to be like right in the center of your foot. You don't necessarily be need, need to be super heel heavy. You definitely don't want to be toe heavy. For the starting position, you're going to be mid-foot heavy. And then as you go through your first pull, you're going to rock towards your heels. So this position is going to be very balanced. You should feel the center of pressure right in the middle of your foot. Right in the middle, not necessarily all the way back on your heels. Last thing is where should you be looking when you're in the starting position for your clean? So if Alex gets into a good starting position again, there's two ways you can think about this. I tend to like to look straight ahead to a point on the wall right in front of me. Some people like to keep a 100% neutral neck, which basically means you're probably looking like maybe 10 feet forward um, on the ground. And then as you go through your first pull, then you can look out um, to a point on the wall in front of you. What you don't want to be doing is looking up too far. You're not looking up and you're not staring at the ground right in front of you. Okay? You're looking out forward, semi-neutral neck, probably picking one single spot to focus on and then remaining focused on that throughout the entire lift. Let's see what Alex was really looking at. <laughs>interpretation of either a good rep or a fault uh, oh, yeah. and then get it up there, right? 
Yeah, that's a tough part. I, I've seen this in competitions yeah. where uh, you've got the announcer who might be a little overzealous, counting reps and out loud off. for an athlete, and, and he's and, and he's, he's done. And no, he <laughs> and he's the, done. The yeah, athletes, uh, the athletes confused. The judge is confused. Yeah, and everybody's confused. And then everyone gets mad at the announcer. I know because this has happened to me. So, <laughs> well, they've been trained by a, a bigger sports. Is that yeah. uh, the score is instantaneous? That's an expectation for a televised sport. Right. If you can't crack that, it's really tough. That's a big mountain to climb. Yeah. And so with this sport, uh, counting reps accurately in real time, and you have to narrow kind of the latency of when the movement occurs. Right. And when it's presented to the audience, so it's actually right. kind of a tough problem, right? You probably have like, I imagine like a room full of people like just zeroing in on, with video and then you also have the refs maybe with a clicker or how does that work? How, uh, how are you guys trying so to So electronic this? clickers are uh-huh. actually uh, interesting but then <clears throat> on these events we found that you possibly are going to have to put a server in right here because there's so much latency even gotcha. bouncing it off to a server off site uh, mm-hmm. like a thousand miles away type thing. Right. So there's a couple things you need to consider there. Uh, you know the other things that you're looking at are um, possibly For example, Pixar uh, across the bay, Uh the way they developed like Woody for uh, Toy Story, Mm -hmm. um, they actually took Tom Hanks and digitized him and made him move by putting these points on all his joints. Oh, right, yeah. That's why he looks so lifelike. That's uh, why it became, uh, you know, and they developed this library after a while. Right. So, uh, for example, classic, is that a good front squat, right? Uh, is hip crease. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But everybody's physiologically different because you have different levers and angles. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I know guys that they're, you know, they're, their hamstrings are on their calves and it still looks yeah. like they're like right at parallel. Yeah, so um, what if you said every time you uh, you have a new athlete come in because it's about a half hour scanning process, you put them in a, in a Pixar type thing where you digitize mm-hmm. that athlete and mark where all their joints are. So. Yeah. You could actually then do visual ID uh, types of technologies where if somebody does a, a squat, um, basically it just computes if the hip joint's lower than the uh, knee joint automatically, even a fraction, you know, yeah. good, good rep. So, so the judge wouldn't need to record the rep. The computer would just count it automatically? Yeah, so that mm-hmm. that's uh, obviously not happening tomorrow. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> if it was, I'd be going public and... <laughs> You know, all kinds of good things. But (laughs) but, uh, that's the way we're thinking about problems like that is how do you narrow that gap from when the uh, activity occurs to when it translates to a number. Yeah. You know, so a couple of experiments we're running this weekend. uh, First of all, people love statistics. So we have this crude printed out program that we can do comparative statistics and uh, circulate that. And so we have people observing how people even leaf through the program. And a lot of times we'll rearrange the pages in different order. Uh, we'll keep some out. Uh, so there's a couple things going on like that. Um, as far as the slides that go up, we put up different infographics, and we'll just have people casually go talk to folks, uh, not identify themselves, and say, hey, uh, so I mean, can you understand that? What's that look like to you? Yeah, so yeah, type yeah. things like that. So we tabulate so if like the lay stuff. person mm-hmm. understands it. I mean, that, that's a big mistake that happens a lot in, in a lot of businesses is the assumption of knowledge. Yeah. You work in this so much, it's obvious to you, but you don't realize it's not obvious to the average person. Well, you know, philosophically, actually, we've organized the whole company around this methodology. Uh-huh. It's, uh, it's uh, We're not doing gut instinct on anything. We mm-hmm. posit hypotheses on everything from user delight to how people like to sit down in an audience. So we're taking it all apart, and these combines are big scientific tests. And we run a couple different scenarios that are within that each time. And whatever one seems to statistically play out the best, then that's the one we'll put more resources into and, and, mm. and retest in a different way. So, and that's very classic mm. A-B testing on websites. Right, right, right. You know, like you ever seen those carousels? So, uh, on, uh, on a front page, you'll see different pictures. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, uh, what happens on those sites is statistically when a picture rotates up, if you click on that, your database records that, and usually on companies are really good at this. Like you'll have four pictures in your carousel, mm. you'll statistically say which one's the winner and loser, and then you'll yeah. rotate off the weakest one every two weeks yeah. and put a new one in. But then you keep a library of all the past contender pictures, mm. and then sometimes you'll recycle one back in because maybe it was uh, 
uh, a really good picture going up against the equivalent of the New England Patriots, and it would have done well by itself. So Mm. you're constantly rotating that out, and it's all statistical. It's not somebody with their own – because every single one of us has uh, prejudices and biases about what's going to work. And so sometimes you get it right, but sometimes you don't. But gut instinct is usually a recipe for failure. Yeah, (laughs) I think think it's good to start maybe with um, gut instinct guesses. Yeah. And then st- test those. Hypotheses. Yeah, hypotheses. There you go. Yeah. That's a good word. Makes you sound smarter. It does. Yeah. And <laughs> it means it's not gut instinct. Right, it's, right. Um, I have this hypothesis that a, a user is going to want to see things this way. Yeah. Yeah, and then you test it, and then you might be wrong, you might be right, and then well, kind of su- removes the bias. I like it, it. It's super rigorous, too, because it means that it's kind of evolutionary. Uh, it, it's subject to pressure testing by the people actually consuming the product. Yeah. So your guys' rules aren't actually set in stone yet, are they? Are you guys still refining the rules of the competition? Absolutely. Everything mm-hmm. is, uh, I mean, we have a good uh, structure just from a top-down macro, mm-hmm. but we're constantly testing, all right, does this word even make sense? Like one big ongoing thing we have is we're developing the language of our sport. Mm-hmm. So we carefully right. consider every single word that we see coming into our uh, ontology. Uh, or our language mm-hmm. that describes our sport and then we'll actually have some pretty good debates say hey I heard this word or uh, does this make sense and if it doesn't then we'll say okay we can't use this word anymore if you hear it make sure you correct somebody saying it until yeah. it becomes part of that so the NLP going on <laughs> yeah 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 so so all that is going on right now and uh, and it goes down to like a really exper- interesting so the grid right? So, you know, it has four boxes. It has those hash marks. So one thing um, that will probably come up is we are probably going to have to name parts of the grid. Oh, yeah. Because I was and sitting the there. The grid is like the field of play, but you, uh-huh. guys, you guys refer to it as the grid? Yeah. Sports okay. language right there, it's the grid. Okay. And so the uh, I was listening to a spectator in L.A. saying, hey, yeah, see that player over in, oh, second box, third hash mark. Yeah, and if there is a number on that, so one approach you could take there is to say box boxes one through four, and there's four hash marks per box. Right, you could say the player over by uh, twenty three. Yeah, right. So instantly you just shorten the cognitive uh, layer there of right. how people recognize where somebody's located. And it was interesting. A, a couple hours later, I was standing there, uh, like listening and making notes about coaches' language to players. And uh, listening to the, the coach doing the same thing. Um, I want you to go sub for so and so, kind of over by that pull up station. <laughs> so, what came out of that is we actually are engaged in an effort of developing our sports language that names the various parts of the grid. Because if the, the coach could say, I want you to go to 23B, meaning uh, the pull up bar in uh, block two by uh, across from grid mark uh, three. Mm-hmm. You can start calling plays. Right. So, you know, there's a, a lot of benefit. Uh, and, and all these things are used to shorten the time from when something happens or when an action happens and making it fast and seamless and crisp and smooth, uh, which is what creates kind of user delight. It's awesome. So using that to, short, to, shorten, to shorten the time it takes to do substitutions and whatnot. You can just call an athlete off and then say, go go, go over to like 4B. There's a and microphone they, they just right run right yeah, instead of using four <laughs> sentences, if you looked at an athlete and said, uh, you know, 41B, boom. Yeah. He's out there maybe uh, climbing the rope, uh, the second rope in, in, in box four. Yeah. So all those things will mean you're a more efficient team. Mm-hmm. Your substitutions are better. And, and over time, these rules are going to be so well understood that the margin of victory is going to be not because of athletic performance. It's what team functions the best as a smoothly running machine, right? Mm-hmm. And cuts out those seconds because every second's going to is, is going to really count. What? Mm-hmm. So you guys uh, started uh, made the announcement for masters. Every team has to have one female and one male masters, and that's that's forty plus. Is that right? Forty plus. Yeah. What made you guys do that? Uh, because there is a good-sized contingent of people who uh, want to have that kind of everyman relationship. But, you know, a lot of guys in their 40s maybe are sitting there going, ah, 
uh, when you're in your 40s, you're no longer an athlete. And yet there's some spectacular guys yeah. and girls who are over 40. I mean, look at some uh, of the uh, Olympic lifting guys, uh, you know, oh, yeah. out of Europe and Russia and whatnot. They, they have long careers, and they, they're super strong. So as a specialist, uh, you could see them go pretty well. And every year you have people in the games who are in their early 40s. All right. They just never, they fade on day three because they don't have recovery. Right, right. But for bursty type things. Yeah, they're probably just fine. Yeah. Yeah, they can stay healthy. They can they can handle that volume. Are, are there going to be any rules on like how much, you know, you have to have a master's division type uh, individual on your team, but is there any rules on how much they have to participate per match? Well, one has to dress every match. Uh-huh. And so in some of the matches, you can't get away with uh, just avoiding using somebody. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as it were, you're going to get some guys who are either really strong or ex-gymnasts who kept it up. or I mean, they're, they're going to contribute equally well. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they have to dress. I mean, w- one issue that came up to me that I was thinking about is, okay, uh, I think Masters over, say, a 16-week season, maybe you're doing one or two matches a week. Mm. I think the wear and tear – on that, so I wonder how many you're going to have to have in reserve. Right. So, yeah. how many people have to dress? Uh, so, right now we're saying four men, four women, uh, one master man, and one master uh, female. Okay. Uh, but we're considering making that five. So that's another area we're experimenting on is uh, team composition that dresses actively for the mm-hmm. match. And you just mentioned having people in reserve. Like, how many people can you have on your team that aren't necessarily competing in each specific competition? So every team um, has uh, 18 people, mm. and there's two men and two women in reserve. So there's 14 that you can mm. choose from to dress for each match, and you can uh, basically dress four people, uh, four men, four women per match. And do you guys have any rules or regulations on how often everyone has to participate? I know you mentioned the, the Masters athlete, but just for everyone in general, like can you have the same four people competing each week and just use it's, them it's until the, they get injured? Or? Yeah, it's up to the teams who they want to have dress every night. Mm. So just like a basketball game, it's like you can play the same five players the whole game and everyone else sits on the bench and you don't have to play any specific players? Pretty much. It's, it's all about who, uh, what team gives you the best chance to win in any given night. Yeah. All right, so we, we're in 2014. We have an abbreviated season this mm-hmm. year, and this is just to kind of kick it off. Not going to do the full season. When does it start and when does it end? How many matches are we looking at? For 2014? Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, it starts towards the end of August. Uh, uh-huh. We don't have an exact date on that, but within a week, uh, you know, probably last week of August, runs five weeks. And then we have playoffs and then a championship game early October. How many matches is that going to be? Uh, you it's you gonna, said one or two a week. How's that going to work out? Actually, it'd be three. So it'll work out about three matches per team. And so it'll be 24. And it's this year is going to be more to establish bracket play Yep. Uh, to seed you for uh, the playoffs. Uh-huh. So basically you're going to do all these, and then every team is going to be in the playoffs, but it's just going to be what your seeding is. Okay. How many teams we got now? So I know you guys – I mean, people are kind of coming on board. Some have announced, some haven't announced. Some people are kind of waiting. How many? How many are like officially? So officially, we have five. Okay. We have the San Francisco Fire, uh-huh. the L.A. Rain, and the Phoenix Rise. And you know, for some reason, the West Coast decided to go down to uh, Elements of Nature. I mean, the <laughs> rain is a play on rain, but. Right. And then you have the Philly uh, Founders and mm-hmm. the New York Rhinos because you know the Rhinos are indigenous to New York City. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, got any more questions for Jim, Doug? Let's see. I think I'm good. He's all out. We'll think of a bunch right after we get off this podcast. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. And we'll, we'll, may uh, try to see if we can get you on with Tony here in a little bit, or maybe we'll just have Tony by himself, and then we'll. You we'll, know, uh, pull Tony in because he he's been. You can look at him as a guy who's been thinking about building a gigantic bonfire for about ten years. So yeah. every time he saw something he liked, he stored it away in his brain and. And he has incredible detail about what the sport should look like, uh, you know, down to look and feel, messaging, everything. It's been a pretty amazing experience. Well, I said all the hard questions for him. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, you, I'm, I'm like the eye candy, the fluffy guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand that question. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, everyone, go ahead and uh, make sure you go over to NPFL.com and check it out. Is, that'll work, right? Or, yeah. Or ProFitnessLeague.com. Uh, both check out both that website if you're interested. Uh, website is looking good. Uh, it's coming along. In the very beginning, it was simple. I actually, did that on purpose. Yeah, uh, we just keep did people it. away. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and and we still had amazing traffic. I, I came on and, and Tony said, "How's that traffic?" And I went, "Wow, for a brochureware site, I, I'm just completely stunned." Yeah, it was like it was like yeah. WordPress 
white. <laughs> yeah, it was like turn of the century black and white newspaper, and people mm-hmm. read every word. It was Absolutely. unreal. And so we've just gradually upped it. We'll switch off the WordPress soon. We're writing our own application right now. Uh-huh. That'll probably happen before uh, the Vegas Combine. Uh, so it'll, it'll work. Okay. So yeah. web app. Excellent. All right. Uh, also, make sure you go over to barbellshrug.com, sign up for the newsletter, and we will update you anytime we visit cool places like this. Later, guys. Right on.